Today I respond to a subscriber who commented on my YouTube channel with the story of his secret porn addiction that he had kept from his girlfriend for several years, and that the shame of this secret that he was keeping from his loved ones was eating away inside of him until he hit rock bottom and decided to confess it all. And his girlfriend, when she heard what he had to say, she took... This is what I get for shooting at the wrong time of day. My options are this or this. All right, here we go. Welcome back to the channel, guys. I'm Noah Church. This channel, you know what it's all about. We're here to help people through pornography addiction, pornography-induced sexual dysfunctions, and other pornography-related problems. I'll say right off the top today, you should definitely read my book if you haven't yet. It's a mistake just to watch these videos and glean little bits of knowledge here and there. Instead, go straight to the source, get some foundational information. You can get the PDF of my book for free. Just subscribe to my newsletter on my website, addictedtointernetporn.com. I'll also say that this Saturday, October... Why don't I ever memorize these dates before I start shooting these things? So. October 26th at 10 a.m. Pacific time. I will be shooting a live stream event on YouTube Q&A. So come in, bring your questions. If you wanted to talk to me, if you want to ask me something, that'll be the time. 10 a.m. this Saturday, Pacific time, the 26th. <laughs> All right, let's get into Anon's letter. When I met my girlfriend, I told her about my porn addiction and how I wanted to quit. Shortly after we got together, I swore off porn and told her I had quit. A month into the relationship, I relapsed. I swore to myself this was never going to happen again, and I didn't tell my girlfriend because it would hurt her. And as far as I knew then, I was over my porn addiction. So there's a lot to unpack in this first few sentences. Uh, it sounds like this Anon started off really well. He met someone he liked, he felt a connection, there was a spark, and he wanted to be open and honest about where he was in his own life, in his development, in his recovery with that new partner. It's a great start to a relationship, being open and honest, uh, presenting yourself for who you are and letting that person decide if she wants to be with you. And that start, unfortunately, got a bit rocky a month in. He was riding that high, that motivation of having recently quit an addiction and thinking that, oh, this means I'm all better because I'm not feeling any urges, but he got complacent. And the two main mistakes that he made were not practicing recovery every single day, instead thinking that he was all better and getting complacent, and then not maintaining that openness and honesty and communication in his relationship which is so important, especially in that romantic partnership. Once an addict, always an addict is a statement that is very true. And I've talked about this on the channel before. It can be misleading to some. They think, oh, well, there's no hope at all. I can never you know, get over this. I can never cure myself of this addiction. And in a way that's true, but it doesn't mean that your addiction has to limit the quality of your life or control your life or your actions or that you'll be constantly plagued by urges and temptations as you might be feeling now early on in recovery if you're watching this during that time in your own journey. But it does mean that though we can be sober and clean and those circuits built into our brain that drive us toward this compulsive behavior can go dormant, they can always be re re I can't speak, be reactivated if we ever get complacent, if we ever stray off the path, if we ever start seeking that type of stimulation again and forget the lessons that we learned that helped bring us to the point that we are now, helped us recover. So you always have to remain vigilant about remaining on the path that you have selected for yourself and being aware when you're starting to stray off and noticing those red flags before they turn into a full-blown relapse. If you're curious if you yourself are addicted, because not everyone who uses porn is, of course, and not everyone with porn-induced problems is an addict, but you should check out the test that I developed that'll give you an idea of whether or not you're struggling with addiction. I'll link to that in the description below. And also, if you'd rather read, 
rather than watching me speak and stumble over my words sometimes, I always do make an article as a companion along with the video. The link for that is in the description below. So if you'd rather read or read along with the video, you can do so there, and all the links will be there as well. Now, what does practicing recovery look like? Uh, it's different for each individual, and it's complex. There's no one-size-fits-all to recovery, but in general, it looks like this. Uh, honesty, both with yourself and your loved ones. It's not like you have to reveal every detail of your addiction to your loved ones, but you have to be honest with them, especially the ones who are closest to you. And that sort of openness and honesty and allowing yourself to be vulnerable is the enemy of addiction and your ally in recovery. Because addiction is a disease of isolation and secrecy and lies and shame. And the more you open up and allow people around you to understand who you really are, to accept you and to support you, the better off you're going to be. Uh, building and maintaining a consistent support system and guidance system for yourself. So having not only your partner, your mentic partner, aware of your recovery, but also other people you can turn to for support, to talk to, uh, for acceptance, for guidance, friends, maybe a support group like a 12-step group, therapist, counselor, coach. Build a support system for yourself because none of us is in this life alone and trying to go it alone is a big mistake. Uh, you got to learn how to face and process difficult and painful emotions instead of feeling those painful emotions like depression, rejection, loneliness, and turning away from them, trying to find a way to escape from them. We have to face them because those painful emotions are telling us that something is wrong and needs to be addressed or that we're missing something. And the only way to truly solve those problems is not to run away from the pain, but to embrace it and learn from it. Uh, discovering our core emotional needs and how to fulfill those in a healthful way. Addicts, they're looking for satisfaction for those, those core emotional needs in the wrong places and places that will never actually satisfy. You might think that you're horny and that's why you're using porn, but it might actually be that you're lonely, that you don't feel accepted and understood. And you're looking for that feeling of acceptance and connection and love where you're not going to find it, which is on a computer screen interacting with pornography. And until we do start addressing those real needs and meeting them, there's always going to be that vacuum. And that vacuum is going to pull pornography back into our lives if we allow it to. Understanding the entire chain of emotions and events and actions that leads back to relapse, that leads to porn. Because it doesn't just happen like that. It's not like you sit down at a computer screen and that's where relapse starts. No, it doesn't start when you type in the search term or when you open up a private browser window. It starts much earlier. And understanding where it starts will allow you the power to cut that chain of events much earlier before you're sitting down at the computer flooded with dopamine about to relapse. And that it's much easier to do it earlier than once you get there. Uh, making your home and your work environment friendly to your recovery. Putting up roadblocks and safety nets between you and relapse is really going to help in those moments where you're just feeling impulsive and where you might otherwise just impulsively use pornography. Having some roadblocks between you and that decision is really going to help uh, allow you the time to make a different decision, to be mindful about what you're doing, uh, to shake yourself out of it. Those roadblocks might look like uh, cutting off the internet from your home or having rules about your devices and where they go and when you use them. And it can also be accountability software, which I highly recommend for anyone on this journey. Uh, the one I usually recommend is Covenant Eyes. That's something that you install on all your devices and you select accountability partners, people you trust in your life to get reports on your online activity. So basically, you know that whatever you look at online if you look at pornography or anything sexual, it's not going to be a secret. And that's really good motivation not to seek it out, not to relapse. All right, he says, My highest streak after that first month with no porn was a week. After a while of relapsing, week after week, I sort of just gave up. I'd half-ass uh, recovery, and then when I wanted to relapse, I'd lie to myself, professing, this is the last time. Uh, no one is better at lying to themselves than addicts are. 
we get very good at it. I got very good at it too. I know this from personal experience, how compelling it can be in the moment to want to rationalize to yourself why it's okay to use porn just this once. Even though a big part of us knows that it's a lie, knows that it's a rationalization, we want to believe it. But we also want to believe that the future version of ourselves is going to be stronger than we are now and is going to pull ourselves up out of this addictive cycle and change our lives. We just don't want to start doing it right now when we feel that urge and when we have that impulse. So I recommend an exercise to get you started overcoming this habit, this cycle, this repetition. And that is a journaling exercise. So get out a piece of paper, make two columns, and in one column, write down every lie or rationalization you've ever used to convince yourself that using porn just this once is okay. And in the corresponding column, the opposite side, write down the truth of the matter. So for example, if your lie is, well, I don't have a very long streak anyway, since I relapsed only a few days ago, and it's going to be much better if I relapse and use porn now. It won't feel as bad as if I relapse after like three or four weeks or a long streak, because then I'll really, really be disappointed in myself. So I'll just do it now, and then I'll build up a long streak later. If that's the lie, then the truth should go something like, well, I'll never have a long streak, much less a permanently porn-free life if I keep making this same decision and keep choosing relapse over taking it one day at a time and building up a long streak of sobriety. And if I want to become the type of person who is porn-free, who makes the decisions that I want myself to make, then I have to start that now because the future me, he is me. And in order to create him, I have to act in accordance with my vision for him right now. All right, Anand says, after almost two years of lying to myself, one night I went on a binge of pornography all night long. Afterwards, at 3 a.m., I felt this huge wave of guilt, self-loathing, and general psychological pain just wash over me. I started crying, thinking about all the times I lied when she asked if I was still using porn. All the times I lied that I had work to do so that I could be alone to watch porn. I realized I couldn't keep doing that anymore. I couldn't keep lying. Every time I lied, it dug a hole in my chest, which by the time this time was a gaping pit. I told myself that morning that as soon as she wakes up, I'm confessing everything, even if that means she wants to break up. So with the possible exception of people like socio sociopaths or politicians or salesmen, um, we are naturally inclined toward love and toward integrity and honesty with each other. And to act against that, it might feel okay in the moment. It might be an advantage in the moment. We might be able to get things or avoid pain or pursue pleasure with lies. And it might even feel good in the moment getting away with something. But in the long run, it hurts us. Every lie hurts us. And the more important the lie or the more important the person is to us whom we are lying to, the worse it's going to hurt. And the more it's just going to dig pieces of ourselves out of ourselves. And eventually, we're going to feel so bad. We're going to want that truth to be free so badly that we hit rock bottom and we bounce off and we make a confession. But <laughs> let me tell you, the earlier you do that, the better, because continuing to lie to yourself, to others, to your loved ones, it's just going to keep digging that pit deeper and deeper. Addiction, like I said before earlier in this video, a disease of lies, secrecy, isolation. And if we can break open those lies, allow ourselves to be vulnerable, show our loved ones who we really are, and see that they still accept us, they still love us, that can be such a huge leap forward in the healing process. And we might think, no, I don't want to hurt them. I don't want to risk rejection. I don't want to make myself vulnerable. So I'm just going to go it alone. I'm just going to do this alone. I'll solve it by myself. And maybe someday after, you know, the problem is in my past, the addiction is in my past. Maybe at that point I'll open up and I'll say, you know, I used to have this problem, but I got it, I got it handled now because I'm a real man. I did it all by myself. 
uh, that just doesn't work. And for most of us, we might go through years trying to convince ourselves that we can do it on our own, just digging ourselves deeper and deeper, getting more and more ashamed, driving bigger and bigger wedges between us and our loved ones until we finally realize, like Anon did, that it has to change. Something has to change. So that's exactly what I did, he says. When she woke up, I confessed everything. I was crying and filled with so much shame and remorse as I told her everything. But as I did, I felt a huge weight lifted off of my shoulders. That was 21 days ago, and I haven't relapsed to porn since. My girlfriend knows that I'm 100% committed to never watching porn again. Right now, I feel a lot more love for myself because I've stopped lying, and I feel a lot closer to my girlfriend because I'm a lot more open and honest with her. I also feel a lot closer than I was to being the man I want to be. Well, let me tell you, my friends, there is no replacement feeling that can take the place of just living without shame, uh, being proud of who you are and the actions you have taken, being able to walk out into the world with your head held high, knowing, you know, I'm doing my best and I respect myself. I'm proud of myself and I'm not ashamed for anyone to see me for who I am. That is a great fucking feeling. Does YouTube still pick up on curse words and censor them? I don't know. Uh, anyway, I don't usually curse on this channel. I don't usually curse in real life, but sometimes for emphasis, you just got to drop the F-bomb. So it sounds like you're on a better trajectory now, Anon, uh, but there are some red flags that I still see in what you say here. You're only 21 days now, porn free, or at least you were when you made this comment. That's still quite early on in recovery. And I'm sure that you were 100% committed to never using porn again when you first got together with your girlfriend and quit. So I ask you what's different this time. And I challenge you that instead of committing 100% to never using porn again, that you instead commit 100% to every day actively and positively practicing recovery. And that you don't get complacent, that you remain vigilant, that you seek to grow and to learn and to develop yourself every day and to be the man that you want to be in the present and on into the future every single day. Practice that every single day and do your best every single day. That is the commitment that I ask of you. And if you make that commitment, then I'll have much more faith and hope and your potential to become permanently porn free than if you just say, I'm committed to never using porn again. Because addiction, it's all about not being able to keep those promises to ourselves. And we have to, a lot of learning to do and a lot of work to do in order to be able to overcome that tendency to break those promises that we make to ourselves. So put in the work and you'll be okay. There might still be relapses in your future. That's all right. That's part of this process. But as long as you're committed every single day to bettering yourself and to practicing recovery, you have a chance. You have a really good chance of living the kind of life that you imagine and having the kind of relationship that you both deserve. All right, this was today's video. I hope you all benefited from Anon's story. And if you'd like some personal guidance along this journey or just a consultation, someone to talk to who's been there, I'm available as a coach. You can find me and how to work with me on my website, addictedtointernetporn.com. And if you want a free way to contact me and get your questions answered, then come see me for my live stream Q&A this Saturday, October 26th, 10 a.m. Pacific time. And remember that uh, daylight savings time change is around now. So if you're in Europe or in the UK, then be extra careful that you come at the right time because it changes at different times for the US and the UK. I know that much. All right, everybody, have a wonderful PMO-free day, and I'll see you next time.